All right, Ryan, tell us what is on your radar. So Associated Press reporter Matt Lee recently did something few mainstream reporters have bothered to do. Press the U.S. government on its effort to extradite Julian Assange and prosecute him for publishing evidence of U.S. war crimes. Let's take a look at his back and forth with State Department spokesman Ned Price. The State Department has an interest in this case, and so I'm just wondering if it is still, uh, if it is still the position of the State Department that uh, Assange is not a journalist and that he is uh, he should be tried um, for theft of. Uh, what are what you would essentially say are state secrets matt by referring to the department of justice as we always do in cases like this it doesn't yeah, indicate no, no, it asking. doesn't indicate we don't have an interest uh, it indicates that we have a respect uh for um the separation yeah, of institutions your, and the independence of the our position department of, justice. of this administration since it came in talking about how important the free, freedom of press is has that hasn't impacted the um the department's uh, position in this case and, is that correct? This is a matter before the Department of Justice. It's a matter the Department of uh, Justice is pursuing. It's not a matter pursuing. before the Department of Justice. It's a matter before the British courts. But, but it, I just want to know if your position, the State Department's position, that you represent to the Department of Justice, who then represents you, uh, has, has changed at all. Uh, Matt, the Department no. of Justice is pursuing this. Um, I will leave it to them to pursue and to characterize the United States government's position on this. So let's unpack the position that the State Department is trying to maintain here. On the one hand, the State Department supports press freedom internationally. Freedom of the press is not just enshrined in our Constitution. It's one of the diplomatic tools we use globally against rival governments, accusing them of cracking down on dissent or otherwise being afraid to let their people speak freely. And so press freedom is something that is quite central to U.S. foreign policy. At least being seen as supporting it is essential. Secondly, as Matt Lee notes here, one of the things Assange is charged with publishing is a sweeping set of State Department cables that expose the inner workings of U.S. foreign policy, laying bare the truth behind many of the lies the U.S. had long been telling. The State Department, therefore, is directly tied into the Assange prosecution. Yet the spokesman insists on putting the question to the Department of Justice. As Lee points out, that's absurd. You can't, on the one hand, say that you support press freedom, but on the other hand, not have an opinion on the most high-profile U.S. assault on press freedom in decades. And maybe there's more to it. The State Department cables that Assange is charged with publishing exposed rampant corruption around the world, but particularly in the Middle East, and those exposures played a major role in fomenting the Arab Spring. The most strident opponent of the Arab Spring was the United Arab Emirates, which tilted its entire regional policy toward crushing every green shoot of popular unrest that cracked through the ground there. They and Saudi Arabia financed a coup in Egypt and civil wars all across the region. The firms they work with closely all need PR help, and for that, many of them turned to West Exec. We've talked about West Exec before on this program. It's the consulting firm co-founded by Secretary of State Tony Blinken, which has sent more staff to senior spots in the White House than any other boutique consulting firm to any White House ever. Now, is Blinken going after Assange on behalf of the Gulf autocrats whose wealth bankrolled him in the past and whose wealth is waiting to bankroll him again in the future? Probably not, but who knows? And it's why our public officials shouldn't have such private entanglements. In the meantime, if the State Department does still support press freedom, one way to show it would be to be honest with the press about it. And Al Alyssa, I'd love to get uh, your, your reaction to that back and forth with, with Matt Lee, who's, who's kind of known as, as, as the, kind of the most dogged reporter in the, in the, in the State Department press corps. And I'm, I'm curious if, if you've been in a situation like that where you have to re you've been told you have to refer questions over to the, the, the you know a particular agency and you want to answer but you're just you just you just can't or you're just not going to well, I've certainly been in that position, and with due respect to Ned Price, who I think is actually very effective at his job, it's also a very common sort of PR tactic when you don't want to have to take a position one way or the other. We would punt things off into the NSC or to the Department of Justice. 
it's untenable for the uh, State Department under Tony Blinken to not take a position at some point on Julian Assange. Uh, this is something that is going to continue to creep up within the Biden administration. And simply saying it's an issue for DOJ is untenable. Um, Matt Lee is one of, is, if not the best reporter in the State Department press corps, and I imagine he's going to continue to push on this. Uh, but it's just not an option to not have a position. And I, I would note one thing. We dealt with this a bit in the previous administration that I served in, where, yes, you would prosecute the whistleblower, the person who leaked the information. So we dealt with a case, not getting into specifics, where the person who actually transferred the national security information to a reporter was prosecuted. But the reporter, the journalist, was not. And that's been sort of the longstanding tradition within the national security community is, yes, we do have to stop leaks from within the government. But once they're in the hands of journalists, that's a matter of freedom of the press. So this is a challenging one for the Biden world. Yeah, I, I want to bring up, you know, Ryan, I think you just really hit on a really important part on your radar when it comes to West exec advisors and that conflict of interest inside of our government. And I don't think people realize this as much that a lot of times these public, you know, supposed to be public servants like Tony Blinken was and also Michelle Flournoy uh, as the undersecretary of the Department of Defense end up going and creating this advisory firm that then because they're advisors and they're not lobbyists, they don't have to disclose who their clients are. And then they end up being considered or end up getting jobs in the next administration. And we don't know what they were doing exactly uh, during that time. You know, we know that even Michelle Flournoy was being considered for the actual Department of Defense job. And then uh, and now Tony Blinken ends up being secretary of state and she's still over there at West Exec Advisor. So there's a lot of this. You know, we don't know what the interests actually are, but we do know they're not for well, they don't seem to at times, or there's a big question of whether or not they're really truly in the interests of the American people. And so, you know, this is kind of one of those things where it's, you know, how do we stop this revolving door into the private sector and then back into government? And it is, seems like once you go into the private sector, you shouldn't be allowed back in. Right. And, and one of the reasons they have these, these laws is not necessarily because you're getting paid off or you're making decisions based on a particular client's interest in that particular moment. But people talk about the idea of an appearance of a conflict of interest, an appearance of corruption. So if, if people lose faith that our, that our policymakers are making policy in the best interest of the United States and in their best judgment, but instead are being influenced by clients from, you know, former, you know, from foreign governments, uh, then, then they, they, lo they lose faith that, there, that there's a credible process going on. And so then any time that American policy is, is running against what the American people might want, but, but is, is aligning with what, say, the Saudi Arabia or the UAE might like, a prosecution of, of Julian Assange and a crackdown on press freedom. They, they, you know, they, they find uh, you know, any criticism of, uh, of their own governments to be a violation of, of, of the law. Like they, they have criminalized that sort of dissent in their own country, and they would love it if the U.S. would move closer to us. So, whenever, so then when you see a decision like that, people, people are going to say, well, they were working for all of these uh, you know, co corporate clients that had, that had ties to all of, all of these autocrats. And yeah, it's one of the oldest secrets, secrets in Washington that you can get around lobbying and disclosure uh, laws if you just frame yourself as a consultant. So you're not subject to fair or regu far regulations the way that you would be if you're lobbying on behalf of foreign governments. You're merely advising them. And there's a lot of that happening within West Exec Advisors, but countless firms around uh, Washington where there is a bit of a revolving door into administrations, both Republican and Democrat. So that's something to always keep an eye on when people are framing themselves is, oh, no, it was purely consulting for foreign governments, not lobbying. It's all the same. But it should be like athletes, right? Like, isn't it once you cross over into professional <laughs> athletics, you're not allowed to come back right. and compete, right? Right. Uh, right. They're no longer amateurs. Right. Uh, the easiest thing they could do is just drop this extradition attempt. Uh, but Alyssa, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing what's on your radar next.